that Jesus referred to as a new commandment. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Don't, 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 don't yell it out yet. Uh, don't spill the beans yet. Uh, we're going to be talking about this today and over the next ten weeks. Uh, but I just want you to think on uh, this sort of picture. You've got 12 Jewish men in the room around the, the Last Supper table. You know, maybe you've seen the painting. And they've been trying their hardest their entire lives to follow the Ten Commandments. I mean, taught those Ten Commandments from uh, a very young age, uh, growing up in typical Jewish household. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, I've got an eleventh. I've got one more. Now if I came into the room today and I stood up on the stage and I said, hey, uh, Pastor Randy has for you an eleventh commandment. Most of you hopefully would leave. Uh, but, but, but he's Jesus, so he gets to do that. And we're going to be talking about that today. Ralph, my friend. Ralph, um, how long have you been coming to River Church? It's been about a year and a half. Oh. Like around Easter of 2018. Yeah. Is when uh, John De Leon and Ryan brought me in here. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it amazes me still that it's been that long. I remember when you first showed up, and I thought I thought that guy's cool. Like I want to be cool. Like I remember thinking that. I really do. And then I got to know you, and you're like. But you're cooler. No, no. Uh, you're into all the cool stuff. You're into coffee and fermented. T what? What? What did you tell me you're, in, you're doing lately? What is it called? It's nothing but fermentation. Fermentation. You don't even know what that is, right? Because like, cause I'm not cool enough to know what fermentation is. But it, he told me about it, and it's, it's awesome. Um, and uh, he's an artist in many ways. Uh, plays professionally in a band, uh, tours, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so i got a few questions for you. First of all, um, you are deeply connected here at River Church. Um, have you, you're 26, mm -hmm. have you been, have you ever been connected to another church before the way you're connected to River? No, sir. It's the first time I've been a part of a church and actively involved in a church. Okay. All right. Um, now, I know that your life has been kind of crazy over the last month or two because your band has been touring a lot. Uh, and you've been on the stage a little bit less because of that. But, but just historically, over the last year and a half, how often do you get together with your River Church friends, like in a typical week? Oh. On a typical week, um, uh, when I wasn't so busy like I am right now, it would be like minimum one, which is the GC day. The gospel community. The gospel community. Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy Garza is always so, uh, Billy and Elise are so welcoming and so hospitable to let us stay there as much as we want to talk amongst each other. You know, just to, uh, for them to guide us with deeper issues that we're dealing with in our lives and stuff like that. And, you know, that's a true blessing. It really is. Yeah. And then um, so either randomly during the week or after service on Sundays is when we get together and hang out with some more. Yeah. So in addition to Sunday morning, you, you hang out during the week. You might hang out after church. You go to gospel community. I often hear, like, Ralph and the gang, it's Friday night. You're going to a tasting or something. So, like, I, I just know that just, just from what I hear, you guys... Mm -hmm. Spend yeah. a lot of time doing life so together. That's right. Okay, last question I have for you. Um, what, is one, what is one main thing that you have, have, have learned here at River Church? Well, all the different aspects of what it takes to form a community. So being selfless and uh, just, you know, serving each other and, and looking out for each other, you know, that kind of stuff. And just giving what we can give for the community, which is our church here, and to keep keep growing it as it goes. That totally sounds like a softball setup question for the sermon, because it is. But but the reason I asked you that and asked you to come up here today is, and I want y'all to know this, is because over the last year I've been I've watched Ralph and I've listened to Ralph and I've I've been so touched and personally proud in the right way. When I would hear him say in groups, you know, in God's, uh, in God's uh, uh, economy, in God's economy, um, we are designed to be people in community. Like, I, like, so it was a setup today as, I ask you, as I've asked him that question, but I asked him to get up here because I've, I've heard him off the cuff 
uh, when he didn't need to speak that sort of language. And so I'm like, ah, Ralph's listening. Ralph, Ralph gets it. So love you, brother. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. All right, give Ralph a, a hand for getting up here. I've asked some of you this question recently, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the question today, just briefly. But I said, what, what do you think? If you could guess, what's the one main reason that people leave the church when they leave the church? There are various reasons. There are actually two really good reasons. I'll give you one really good reason why people leave the church when they leave the church, and that is, a person leaves church when he does not make friends, when she does not find a community, a place of belonging. Or, as in our case here at River Church, uh, apparently Austin is a really cool place to live, and we've had a lot of people leave uh, and move to Austin. So that's a, personally for us as a church, that is a reason why a lot of people uh, leave. But, but, but seriously, one main reason that people leave the church is because they just don't find a home. They just don't find friendship. They continue to live sort of anonymously within the, uh, the community of, of faith. And that's a, sad, that's a sad way to live. It's true nationally. As I go and talk to my, my friends who are pastors in other places around the country. And it's true here at River Church. It's true here in the, in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the people who have left River Church, most of the time, they never really made close friends. And so, like, I'm on this, this, uh, this mission. Uh, I want more for us. I want more for us. I want, like, what Ralph has described, the, the experience that he has here at River Church, I want that for us. Um, Maybe you have voiced, I've got some, some common sort of, y'all didn't write these, but maybe you can relate to them, common sort of thoughts that people have uh, in All right, let me go back. Maybe you've felt one of these before. Maybe you've said this to yourself. I, I don't really feel like I'm connecting with people here at the river. Or maybe you've said I haven't really wanted to go to church lately. Like it's just, there's something in me that just, just kind of feel kind of this lazy sense of wanting to just stay home. Or maybe you'd say, there really aren't that many people like me at this church. That's common. That's common within small churches to feel that way. Because there just aren't enough people to, to where you can find like a, a mass of people that are just like you. I'm going to I'm going to push against the notion that that's even what you should be looking for. But, but, but maybe you said, there really aren't that many people like me. You know? I'm, I'm single and everybody's married. Or, or I'm married and a lot of single people. Or I'm old and everybody's young. Or I'm young and everybody's old. And I don't mean to make light of it. But we often feel this. Maybe you felt that in the last. Everyone is busy doing their own things. So it's just all we can do to just get together on a sunny morning. If that. But people are busy and I don't want to be a bother. I want to speak a word of caution uh, into your life uh, regarding this, this notion, this idea of forming a club and calling it a community. Forming a club and calling it a community in your own personal life uh, or in the life of the church. Here's what I mean by that. We live in a very, a very hobby-driven culture because we're all pretty wealthy and we've got like discretionary time and discretionary income to spend on, on stuff. So we live in a very hobby driven uh, sort of culture, a very affinity or special interest driven sort of culture where everybody wants to just hang out with, with people that, that are like them, that think like them uh, or look like them. Uh, or vote like them, or, or play with the same toys that they play with. We live in a culture where we, we tend to really gravitate toward people that are just like us, and we often don't spend much 
time with people who aren't like us. It's a very polarizing trend. It's not brand new, but it seems to grow exponentially. It seems like it has over, over my life. This, 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 this sense of, of cloistering and only hanging around with people that, that are like you, and it, cre- it creates a very divided sort of community. Rick, I asked him if I could do this ahead of time. Rick, would you stand up? You know Rick. Rick's been here for a few years now. Rick and I are in the same gospel community. And we've grown to be pretty good friends. Like I know when bad stuff's going on in his life, like, like, hurt, like, like sad things, like there was just a loss in his life lately. And I knew about that. And he knows likewise. And so uh, when I laugh, he laughs. And, and when, when he's in sorrow and crying, I'm in sorrow and crying. We're, we're growing in our friendship. And there's more uh, more to, 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 to we're going to grow even, even more closely in years to come. But we're, we're quite close. In, uh, there are very few things that we have in, in common. I wrote, I wrote down like Rick and Randy. and So Rick is, Rick's Hispanic. And I'm, I'm, I'm white. I know there's been some debate about that. But I'm actually, <laughs> actually white guy. Um, <laughs> Rick grew up nominally Catholic, and I, I, I grew up Protestant. Um, Rick is a plumber, and I'm, I'm a pastor and a fisherman. Uh, Rick, Rick went to Porter, right? And I went to Hannah. Uh, Rick, uh, Rick lives in, uh, in Southmost, and I live now in Los Fresnos or kind of outside of Los Fresnos? I mean, in, in, in many, many ways, we are very different. It smacks against the notion that in order to find a friend, you have to find a friend who is just like you. The one, the one thing that draws us together is our love for Jesus. And the Dallas Cowboys, kick, kickoffs at 3 o'clock, right? <clears throat> Go Cowboys. Um, that is the one thing. Thanks, Rick. You can, you can sit down. That is the one thing that binds us together. Rick is a lovely man, and I, I enjoy spending time with him, but our paths would not have crossed except by the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit under the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what has brought us together. It's easy to form a club. Some of you have done that. It's, it's easy to spend time with people that are just like you, think like you, act like you. Finding community with people, uh, with people you have no shared hobbies with, then now that requires the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians he uses the phrase the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in reference to the church. That'd be kind of a cool name for a church. like The fellowship of the Holy Spirit church. It comes out of 2 Corinthians 13. It's not working. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 verse 14 it says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's what has to happen for us to be a community of faith, for us to be friends, for us to actually be drawn together in more than just a superficial manner. The Holy Spirit has to do that. Got three big ideas today. The first big idea is this. My identity is found in the community of faith. Not in isolation, not in individualism, not in my quirky sort of characteristics. My identity doesn't lie in all of those unique aspects to how I have have created my own persona, how you see me. 
Uh, my identity, if I'm a Christ follower, my identity, if, I've, if, I, if I believe the Bible, all the teachings of the Bible, then my identity is found in the community of faith. Identity, if you even use that, that word, or if you don't use that word, let me, let me remind you what, what that is. My identity is the, the fact of being who a person is. So who you are, who a person is, that is their, their identity. How I see myself. And typically I'll have several identities. The way that I want you to think about me. The way that I really know that I am. And then our true identity is, is who God sees us as. So my identity is found in, in the community of faith. I can say that. Most of us don't believe that. I want to attempt. It's a hard sell. But I want to attempt to convince you of that right now. In much of the world. In much of the world. If I asked the question. If, if I asked, who are you? If I live somewhere else in the world and, and I think on this question, who am I really? In, in, in much of the world, the answer, uh, is, it, it's answered communally. Like in relation to the people around me and, 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 and who I, this group that I belong to. That, that's not true in the United States. It's not true in Western Europe. In, in, in the United States and in, in, in Western Europe, we are so highly individualistic and, and so competitive. And we, we so highly value our individuality that we see our identity as individuals. We see our identity as being so unique that there's nothing community driven about how we see ourselves, how I see myself. When you ask me the question, who am I? I would answer in a very individualistic way. May I say gently that that is not a biblical view of who you are as a person, of your identity. A biblical view says that you are an individual who is part of a larger community. Part of something bigger than yourself. Part of a spiritual community. Much like Jesus' identity cannot be separated out from the Trinity. Let me say that again. Jesus' identity cannot be separated out from the Trinity. He was so deeply connected to the Heavenly Father that he would go around saying, referring to himself as the Son of God. It was a vital part of his identity. Your identity is likewise inseparable from your spiritual relationships. Some of you have really, really uh, poor relationships, if any at all, with Actual, biological family members. And that's sad. And I, I weep with you. I really do. And I, those of you whose story I know, I, I pray for you. But, but, but the good news is, what you need to understand is that, that in the community of faith, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, then a Christian ethic, a Christian belief... Jesus' teaching is your identity is inseparable from your spiritual relationships, even if you have no biological relationships whatsoever. God did not save you and then offer you merely the option of being a part of the church. We treat church as though it's optional. Uh, it is one of many really good um, opportunities, options throughout the week. But, but it's not optional. The work of God has always been about his people. It's, it's, it's always been, yes, saving you individually, but, but way more than that. God's work has always been about saving a people whom he cherishes as his own possession. In, in the book of Titus, it says, who are eager to do good works. We have made Christianity 
like this solo endeavor. We have made Christianity like this lone wolf endeavor. But it's never really been that. It's just not going to work. Is, is this going to work? Let me see, so I don't have to... All right. All right. In the book of Titus, we're going to look at several places th this, uh, today where, where, where God says that he is claiming for himself a people. In the book of Titus, it says save, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. The history of the Bible is God is reclaiming for himself a people for his own possession. The point, the point is this. The church is not a divine afterthought. You're not saved. And then if you'd like to, you become a part of this community of faith that, is, that, are, that are a people for God's own possession. It's not optional. It is God's design. Fellowship in the local church body, it's, it's never been an option. Another place is First Peter. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The point today, these are really rich passages. They've got many points to them. The point today is, in both of these passages and several others that we will look at, God's plan in salvation has always been to save for, to raise up for himself a people for his own possession. That he would call his own, his adopted families, adopted children. Back to personal Identity, how you see yourself. Most of us go through life trying to earn an identity. Like prove yourself in front of everyone else. Prove your worth. Maybe you've spent all of your life trying to prove your worth to an elderly parent now. Show that person that you've made something of your... The point is, we, we take our identity seriously and, and we go through life trying to earn it. Do you know that in God's economy, this is a Christian ethic, a Christian teaching. Do you know that in God's economy, you don't earn your identity? It, it is graciously given to you by God. You should understand that. If you're a Christian, this is, this is a truth that you must believe as a Christian, my identity is graciously given to me by God. It's not forged in like the struggle and the competition of life and, and one day I will prove myself and I will, I will achieve for myself the identity that I've always wanted. The gospel message says that we are graciously given a new identity by God. Yet the average churchgoer, it's probably you, the average churchgoer sees himself as, as this individual attempting to, to prove himself, to prove his worth by juggling many and various responsibilities. I'm going to show you a little diagram. Okay, so the bearded person on the bottom, that's you. If, if you're a gal, then just forget the beard. Just That's you, okay? Okay. Um, so, so this, is, this is how most of us go through life, juggling various responsibilities. One of those being church. But there are many other responsibilities that we have in life besides just church. So in this diagram, you've got, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, uh, we've got, if you're a student, you've got schoolwork. And then let's say, you, you, go, you go to work, and so you may not wear a suit and tie. Nobody really does anymore, but you, you got work. You got school, you got work. You've got your uh, home life. There's a mailbox there, so I'm going to call that your, your family, your home life. You've got your obligatory uh, social media time, right? Can't miss that. And then you've got your finances. 
And we've got several other things that we try and juggle. And so the average churchgoer, you, you are doing your best to, to juggle and, and maintain some sense of balance in life. But let's just, let's just face the fact that sometimes one of these areas, maybe it's work or maybe it's your money, that you know, need for money, something blows up. And for a while, you have to take some time off from church because something blew up and you got you to gotta take care of that. And so something's got to give, and so maybe church gives. I'll give you a real-life example. Maybe Lydia and I decide that we're going to have another baby. Nah. Um, <laughs> let's, let one, let's let one of the younger couples have a baby. <laughs> um, let's say one of the young couples uh, decides to have another baby. And then, uh, you know how life is, if you've ever had a child, life, life uh, just gets super crazy for a little while. And so then, you find it difficult to juggle all of the responsibilities, and, and, and a brand new baby is so tender and, and, and so uh, vulnerable that it's just, you know, it, you just got to take a little time off. And that's, I totally get that, you know. I've been there. Totally get that. So that's what we're going. What we're trying to do. We're just trying to juggle all these balls, juggle all these responsibilities. Uh, but, but you see, when when someone becomes, a, when I become a Christian, when when you become a Christian, things change. And that now, now I'm no longer going at it solo. Now I belong to to God, and I belong to this this community of faith. Again, it's 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 not optional. I belong to my brothers and sisters in Christ. So I don't have the, the option of, of just going it alone anymore. That's not really a viable option. It's not tenable given the teachings of Jesus. So, so consider this alternative um, diagram. And, and you see life as being like a wheel. And uh, at that, the hub of this wheel, which is your life, is, is you and your gospel community. Or you, you know, like Ralph and his, his, his friends here at River Church. It's you and, and your people. And then all of your responsibilities are spokes that come off of the hub. Spokes that connect that, the wheel of your life. But in this model, what's different mostly is what's at the center the hub, it's not you by yourself as an individual. It's, it, it's, it's you, it's me as a member of community of faith. So if we could revisit that story, uh, Liddy and I have a baby. We'll go back to that one. Liddy and I have a baby, and, and I'm like, man, I got no time to preach. I got no, like all we do is, everything we do is revolves around this baby. And so maybe someone in my gospel community says, look, um, we're going to start bringing you meals a couple nights a week. And we don't, think, we don't think you quitting on church, even for a season, is an option. So, so you know what, Randy? You've got to get to church early on Sundays. We'll pick Lydia up, uh, and we'll give her a ride so she doesn't have to mess with the car seat and stroll around. Like, we'll help her get here because we're doing life together. You know the most uncomfortable part of this second approach? is that I'm required to humble myself. I'm required to seek advice, input, even permission from my core group of friends before I make any drastic, course-altering sort of decision in life. And let's be honest, we don't, we don't really want to do that. That's more than we bargain for when we decided to pick a church. Would anybody have the courage to say, take a lot of courage to raise your hand, would anybody have the courage to say this, I'm considering a decision in my life right now, and I would rather not give anyone authority over that decision. Power over my life. I would rather just do 
what I want. See, a Christian ethic is that we are made, we always have been made, we have been made to live life in, in community. From the beginning that's been true. From the beginning. God looked down and he said, let us make man in our image. The Trinity. Living in harmony. Living in voluntary submission to one another. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in that image. We have always, always been designed to live in community. Because God is a social God. God is not a solitary being and we're made in his image. This social God. And from the beginning, in the, in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, God says, it is not good for man to be alone. Right? And me, we, we merely write that off as being some sort of uh, admission of some sort of sexual need. But in every way, in the deepest sense of the word need, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. these passages. In Exodus 6, 7, it says, I will take you to be my people, this community, and I will be your God. In Exodus 19, it says, you shall be my treasured possession. And then I think of Jesus' poignant words. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. We have been made, we've always been made to live in community. Now how can that be safe? Because we've all been burned relationally in the past. How can it be safe to entrust my life to others in the church? It must be rooted and grounded in this four letter word that we'll be talking about over the next ten weeks. The word Love, and it comes to our. This takes us to our last, our last big idea today. We're just scratching the surface. This is a fly overview. We're going to go. We're going to drill down deep over the next ten weeks. The last thought for the day is: this, the new commandment that Jesus gives to the church is to love one another. As I said earlier, he looks at the. Uh, 12 disciples and he says, I've got a new commandment for you. That you love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you, what, love one another. I wonder if they were waiting for something way more profound. Like that's, that's it. Like, he said you have a new commandment. Like, that you love one another. Now we, we, we tend to read into this. We tend to read into this. And there's a, there's a great context to this that I'm going to be preaching about next week. And so uh, if you find this fascinating, come next week. It's it, the whole evening that Jesus spent uh, with the disciples. is just fascinating. But, but we tend to take this and misread it based on on a lifetime of, of reading this common passage and think it to mean like if you love others if you're if you're nice to your taxi cab driver if you're nice to your yard man if you don't chew out the lady on the telephone that's trying to help you with your internet service like if you you should love others but that's not what Jesus said here. Jesus is looking at 12 men who are, who are uh, about to go through hell because their leader is going to be crucified. And he says to them, like, like this all you, this, you're all you've got. 
I have a new commandment for you, and that is that you love one another. And by this, everybody's going to know that you're my followers. He doesn't say, you be lovely to the world, although we should be, and he does say it in other places. He doesn't say, go out and serve and give a cup of cold water, and, and they'll know you by your fruits. No, he says that other places, but here what he says very specifically is, you love one another. And it'll have this incredible evangelistic sort of result. One of the men that was sitting in that room today, or that day rather, was the disciple uh, who, who was referred to, he actually referred to himself as the, the one whom Jesus loved. You know him as John. The disciple John. The disciple John, he was, he, was, he was known as Jesus' closest friend. The, the apostle John, he's the one that when Jesus was a bloody mess hanging there on the cross, he says of his mother Mary and, and his friend John, he says, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. In other words, John... You've been my closest confidant in life. Take care of my mother. Mother, take care of my friend John. John, the apostle who wrote five books, two, three, four, five books in the New Testament. One of our church fathers. According to written history from the second century A.D. Uh, John lived to an extremely old age, uh, to the degree that he had to be he had to be carried to the Christian meetings, the church services in Ephesus. Couldn't walk. He was decrepit. He was so old he could barely talk. But according to church history. He would be taken to these meetings and he would simply repeat over and over all he had to say at the end of his life. He would simply repeat, little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. It's a message repeated in, in, it repeated in several of his writings that made it into the Bible. Little children love one another. We're going to look at one of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to actually skip all the way to verse 16. It's the Apostle John. He says, By this we know love, that he laid down... His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. For the church. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart again to him, uh, against him rather, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk. But in deed and in truth. You see, that's been the message written to the church throughout the New Testament that is oft missed. That, is, that has been the central message to the church. Love one another. We barely know one another. Love each other. So my goal for the next 10 weeks is to take us on a culture shifting sort of journey. Next week we're going to look at, at what it really means for Christians to love one another. What did Jesus have in mind when he said, love one another? What did the Apostle John have in mind when he said, love one another? Next week, I'm going to explain that in detail from 
the scriptures. This Wednesday night, I'm going to ask you to, to, to draw on your table and to, to discuss with one another some of these interesting reasons why we don't confide in one another, why we, we, we don't really trust one another. It's going to be fun. It's going to be lighthearted. Nobody's going to ask you to air your dirty laundry, but I do believe it'll be insightful. I do believe it will be deeply encouraging for our elementary students, for our youth, and, and for our adults. Let us take this to a new level. As a church, this new commandment that Jesus gives us, that we love one another. May we as River Church take this to a new level. We say, we say it's one of our distinctives. We say that we prize community. And we as your elders are attempting to lead you there, to go there first and say, follow us. We, we say that we prize community. Let's go there together. Let's begin by meeting together every Wednesday night for the, next, for the next eight weeks. I know you're busy. Look, you know what? So am I. So, so are, so are most, most everyone in this room is busy and tired. But might this perhaps be a life-giving endeavor? begins three days from now when we get together on the first Wednesday night. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you will join us. Make sure that you put it on your connection card. We need to know who's going to be here. To that end, that we might love one another deeply, to that end, we're going on this journey over the next ten weeks. Come go with. Come go with. Join me in prayer, please.